Hello and welcome to this round six of Pro Tour Dominaria here from Richmond in Virginia. I'm Tim Willoughby, this is Pro Tour winner Simon Gertsen and we're going to get a head chance to head back down to our feature match area. We've already seen a lot of the key player decks in this format but by no means all of them. We're going to get a chance to see just a few more of the different op options available to you if you're looking to play standard in the coming weeks and months as we head down for our next round here from Pro Tour Dominaria. Hello and welcome to this round six of Pro Tour Dominaria. I'm Tim Willoughby, sat alongside me is Simon Gertsen and we're gonna get a chance to see a couple more top players in our feature match area. First up from Team Snapcaster is Gregor Kowalski. Uh, Kowalski, there you see him just preparing himself mentally and physically for this, this sixth round of the feature match area. Each of these players four and one. His opponent is Petr Sahurek. Uh, he is playing for Team Revelation, uh, the sort of the side team to Team Genesis, and we're going to get a chance to see what these guys have brought to the table as Steel Leaf Stompy, uh, Gregor Kowalski, kicks things off with Greenbelt Rampager, just revealing it, generating some energy. Soon enough, he will have a 3-4 for just one mana. The next turn, just casting it, then casting it again, spending all of that energy. Now he's got a 3-4 on turn two. That's already a pretty impressive rate. On the other side of things, Petr Sahurek, he's working on a different pace. Uh, search for Azkans are coming down initially for him. He's got blue, he's got white, and we can see from that deck name there that he's actually on a blue-white control deck that has Approach of the Second Sun as its win condition. The Approach will, of course, come that much faster when you've got all of the uh, filtering ability of Search for Azkanta, that a nice addition to control decks everywhere. But it may be that the Fumigate is the card that he's most excited about having initially in the opening hand, just so that he can make sure that if this Steel Leaf Stompy deck on the other side of the battlefield does get a lot of creatures down, he's able to deal with them comparatively easily. He is taking three a turn, but his turn two play is arguably uh, the stronger one. Being able to filter through your draws like that is super powerful when you're playing a deck that is basically pure control. Yeah, while the life total's 20 to 14, casting approach to the second sun just on its own will get some of that life back. And right now, at least Gregor Kowalski is not really following up with too much in the way of threats. Uh, though, one option available to these green decks is to hold up Blossoming in Defense so that if you do have one threat, you can at least make sure that it's going to be a tenacious one. Now, for Petr Sahurek, I guess one of the key considerations is just hit those land drops. Hit them each and every turn in the early stages of the game because you do have this very expensive sorcery to cast. And while his is a deck that wants to go into the late game, you don't want to have to force that to be too late in the game. Ideally, get the, uh, the win good and early. And various of the blue-white decks in this format have very few uh, win conditions. The ones with the approach to the second sun in some respects can be the more aggressive in, uh, in actually closing out games. Yeah, very, very nice uh, touch here to put Seal Away on, uh, in your graveyard uh, with Search for counter. That yep. means that Peter is not running into Blossoming Defense, does not take two extra damage from it. And also, he's really digging towards uh, his win conditions and uh, the more powerful answers in his deck. We did see Blossoming Defense there just to deal with uh, Blink of an Eye, not only meaning that there's not going to be the uh, the bounce on the creature, but also because the spell didn't have any uh, targets upon resolution, uh, no card drawing either there. So Petr Sahurik, he's on 11 life. Um, even though Kowalski has not deployed very many threats, s pretty soon uh, Sahurik could find himself in a spot of bother here. Galta Primal Hunger languishing in Kowalski's hand. He's going to struggle to cast that one anytime soon, but... If his opponent is on single-digit life turtles, maybe he won't mind too much. Resilient Kenra now coming down for Gregor Kowalski. That will be another source of a little bit more damage coming from the Steel Leaf Stompy list. Incredible synergy with Galta, by the way. Uh, having a two-drop that effectively brings four power to the battlefield. 
And of course, the Eternal Eye is pretty relevant. It's not too difficult for these green decks to end up with plenty of mana. Essence Scatter coming from Kowalski. That will be enough to mean that the Kenra dealt with, at least for now. Uh, though the Eternal Eye, of course, there's not really too much that can be done to stop it beyond a disallow already one of them in the graveyard for Petr Hurek. And so Hurek chose to put a planes into his graveyard. Now he doesn't have a second white source at the moment. Yeah, I mean, a Fumigate in hand. There was every reason to expect that he would find one sooner or later. And actually, it looks like on his, uh, his draw this turn, he did find uh, a Plains. So things still trucking here. But with Hashap Oasis in play for uh, Gregor Kowalski here, he actually threatens quite a bit of damage. And if Sahurek, I mean, if, if there was the likes of Resilient Kenra here, in addition to that uh, Hashap Oasis, he could find himself in a spot of bother. Brazilian Kenra is almost lethal here. Would be attacking for seven. I mean, I guess, as things stand, for Petr Sahurek, it's alive or dead at this point, rather than the details of his life total. Double syncopate in hand, so he's he's got lots of ways of stopping anything that's coming from Gregor Kowalski's hand, but as already noted, Eternal Eyes operates a little bit differently when it comes to counter magic. I don't know this necessarily would have been how Kowalski would have drawn up too many of his games going, but he'll take the wins where he can get them. Peter is now representing Settle the Record, of course, as well. So Gregor has to really think about what to play around and how to play around certain cards here. Yeah, uses the Hash of Oasis there uh, means that he can keep mana up for uh, Blossoming Defense if he needs to. A bit of respect there from Kowalski does not elect to play his pump spell into the face of all of that uh, untapped mana from Sahurek, even though it represented a lethal swing. Yeah, that would have been a bit too greedy, I think. Okay. Memorial to Genius, drawing past Sahurek a few cards. Quite a few utility lands available to these blue-white decks these days uh, between the various deserts available and these new memorials uh, as an ability to draw a few additional cards. As things stand, though, all of this hard work that uh, Petr hurek has been doing to dig through his deck, it's not managed to find him a way of uh, gaining any life. And somehow or other, he's been facing down one creature for essentially the entire game, and that one creature might go the entire distance here. I believe that the life totals haven't been updated, because we saw an attack for six go through. Yeah, we definitely have Sir Hurek close to the brink here on uh, this, this first game in the series. This yeah. is, of course, best of three. These guys each at four and one going into this round. And here comes a seal away. That will be enough to potentially deal with uh, the one elephant on the battlefield. Results. The elephant in the room, if you will. So in lets the seal away resolve and then plays his Blossoming Defense. Um, Syncopate is enough to stop Blossoming Defense, and that means that now uh, the one creature available to Kowalski all dealt with. So Huracan 2, so it's not as if uh, Gregor has to do a whole lot to win this game, but at the same time, uh, Petr Sahurik, he's got lands in play, he's got uh, Search for his Canter ready to transform. This is kind of how he closes things out. And what, what a close call as well. Uh, the Blossoming Defense there would have won Kowalski the game had it resolved earlier. And here, Peter just had enough mana to, to syncopate uh, Kowalski, but only barely. Out of Kieran coming down there. No really big plays to allow him to punish uh, Sahurik too badly. Obviously, the ideal would be to find uh, some sort of immediate damage, but that's not really what this Steel Leaf Stomp Stompy deck's all about. Uh, it has to at least wait until its creatures get over summoning sickness. You can see Kowalski just kind of looking as on as that search for Azkanta does transform now. We have a persistent sort of source of card advantage now for Petr Sahurik. And as and when he needs to, he already has Fumigate to deal with most creatures. Heart of Kieran, though, I guess, one of the trickier creatures for Sahurik to deal with, given that 
sorcery speed removal will not be good enough. It also has vigilance, so it will never be tapped, uh, making your seal away worthless. And uh, Kowalski has a creature in the graveyard to eternalize, so counter magic is not relevant. So here comes Teferi, the hero of Dominaria, and immediately I'm seeing the advantage bar swing. Talk us through exactly how important Teferi is at this point. Teferi is the card that Peter was drawing towards uh, when he was aggressively digging with Search for Escanta. Here, he's actually showing us why Teferi is so good. Effectively, it has only cost him three mana during his turn. And there's a cast out even in hand here for Petr Sahurek. So even as much as we spoke about the Heart of Kieran being one of the more problematic permanents to deal with, actually, this is where a position where Petr Sahurek can deal with uh, the problematic vehicle. So there we see a timely cast out, meaning that uh, at least for this turn, Peter Zurek does not need to worry about getting uh, beaten down for the final two points that would be necessary to close out the game. And at this point, it may well be that um, Sir Hurik elects to deploy that Fumigate just to try and make sure that the board completely clear. Uh, not too much in terms of cards in the graveyard to worry about anymore. It's just whatever's going on in Kowalski's hand. Also, he knows that he will have uh, card advantage throughout this game. Uh, he has the mana, he has the Escanta. He's not really concerned about Galta. In fact, Kowalski can't even cast it. Well, another copy of Heart of Kirin. Everything that we said before remains true here. Uh, while Petr Sahurik did gain a single point of life off that Fumigate, three, still less than four last time I checked, and that means that one swing will be enough from the big vehicle. Escanta the Sunken Ruin allowing Sahurik to find some spell or another here. Got a few interesting choices. Could go for uh, the second sun, or indeed um, a little bit more counter magic in Disallow. Does go for Approach of the Second Sun. The life gain on Approach of the Second Sun, pretty relevant to him here. It buys him time, even though he's going to have to tap comparatively low to cast it. It does mean that he's still got the um, that little bit extra to work with, and of course, Teferi also functionally giving him a few more lands here. Yeah, and uh, don't forget that Escanta synergizes very nicely with Approach of the Second Sun as well. We will actually uh, probably see that here, the combination of having Approach of the Second Sun, Teferi, and Escanta. Yeah, you dig very, very deep, very, very quickly. This is not like where uh, you were previously having to put the Approach of the Second Sun seven cards deep and then <coughs> cycle your way into it over a turn or two. Just the addition of uh, Search for Iskanta means that you're digging very quickly indeed. Kowalski not even having a play here. And uh, I guess for us it's kind of nice that we can still see the approach of the second son in the library. Might not be technically correct to have a face-up card there, but... It is known to both players. Yeah, it looks like the judge is just cleaning that up. As much as we like it, and maybe you guys at home like it, we got rules to work with here. These guys are playing at a professional level. And in principle here, is there enough mana to activate um, as Cantor again, find the approach, and then cast it? Yes, there is, and that's enough for the handshake. Uh, even though Gregor Kowalski on 20 life, doesn't matter. Approach the second sun. The second time you cast it from your hand, that's enough to win the game, and that's enough to square things up, meaning that Petr Sahurik, in spite of everything that we saw for almost every stage in that game where he was far, far down on life, picking up the game win, and we will see more from him after these messages. So Magic the Gathering Arena, we chose that word arena very particularly because an arena is a place where people gather, where people come to compete, where people come to spectate and cheer on their favorites. It really is a place where the whole community can come together and experience the very best of what Magic has to offer.
Hello and welcome back to this round six here at Proto Dominari in Richmond, Virginia. I am Tim Willoughby alongside Simon Gertsen. But right now, it's not either of us talking that you should be waiting to listen to because Marshall Sutcliffe down on the floor has a few updates for us on the other matches that are going on in our feature match area. Thank you, Tim. So down in the feature match area here, over on the far right from where I'm standing, we have John Finkel playing against David Martinez. Now, this is David's first time in the feature match area. And of course, he has to sit across from the GOAT. Had a little bit of a misstep in game one where he uh, forgot to get back his rekindling Phoenix and that opened the door for John to kill the elemental token. And uh, that game did not go well for him from there. So John Finkel wins the first game there. Directly to my right, we have Andrew Cunio playing against Greg Papura. Greg picks up game one because his blue-black mid-range deck managed to get out ahead. And of course, the uh, blue-black control deck, once it falls behind, it can get pretty tough. And uh, he was able to push through the win there, just getting started on game number two over there. And here right in front of me, Andrew, uh, excuse me, um, Eric Froelich versus Andre Strasky. They're still in game number one, and it's a bit of a mess, a lot of value going on with Scarab Gods and Karn and that kind of thing. Lovely stuff. Sounds like an exciting one. Kind of intrigued to see how this uh, blue-green Karn deck especially ends up playing out in our field. One of the decks that maybe was not so high on many people's radar going into the event, but you can bet that it will be something they'll be checking out by the end of things, uh, either firing it up on Magic Online, taking it to a local tournament, or, you know, just at the kitchen table with friends. Uh, as things stand, though, on our main match between uh, Gregor Kowalski and Petr Sohurek, Sohurek able to pick up the first game, and it looks like these guys just drawing their opening hands. So we'll get a chance to head back down to our number one table and find out whether or not they're it's going to be a straight 2-0 for Sahurek, or if Kowalski can bounce back. He's got a Lamoir else to start, which is not too shabby, especially when followed up by Steel Leaf Champion on the second turn when your opponent only has a Plains in play. Steel Leaf Champion, just a gigantic threat. Uh, not too many blockers going to be deployed by Petr Sahurek. As things stand, though, he needs to worry about the fact that he's going to be taking damage in chunks of five from that champion if he can't find an appropriate removal spell. A lot of uh, blue white's answers don't really care about power or toughness, but the clock that puts on him is uh, critical. I see a seal away though. Yeah, seal away, almost the ideal answer here. Get rid of that steel leaf champion for good. Do so for two mana. It costs three mana, so that's kind of uh, the ideal. When your removal costs less than the threat that it's removing, that means that from a mana perspective, you're a little bit ahead in the in the uh, equation there and. It looks like I'm intrigued here. So we saw the seal away being played by Sahurik, but he did so after combat. I presume that meant that he sniffed out that there could have been a blossoming defense, and he ju just would rather avoid taking even more damage. So while it might have looked like a bit of a strange bit of timing, he's at 14 rather than the 12 that he could have been at. Yeah, and, and this is the kind of high-level subtleties that I was looking for at this Pro Tour. This is not something you do when you start playing a format. You you have a seal away, you seal away that turn 2-5-4, but here you can see uh, two players really playing at a super high level. Kowalski, of course, also not tapping out. Uh, I don't know if he, if he could have, but uh, leaving up that one mana to protect his uh, most important threat. Now, of course, with Sahurik, he has so much instant speed interaction. I believe that there was also the potential for an essence scatter from him. He wasn't going to be able to play that on Heart of Kieran. Once he was aware that the best that he was going to do with his mana was deal with uh, a 5-4, he took a shot. Admittedly, that shot missed, but I liked the thinking that went behind it, keeping himself as safe as he could. And actually, a second seal away is enough to finally deal with that uh, champion. And, and that means that now things a tiny bit more stable, and this time round, unlike in game one, in addition to already having the approach of the second run, second son, already having Teferi in hand, there's also a settle the wreckage. So for Sahurik here, in some respects, he's in a far better spot. My slight concern is that he's got three lands and no way of finding more of them right now. Yeah, and he has kind of tapped out this turn, so now Kowalski is free to add to his board. That Nissa on top of his library is going to be troublesome for Sahurik. A uh, nice little play here from Kowalski. It's not a new one, but one that we still like. Uh, so that's Greenbelt Rampager getting cast. Uh, no extra energy in the pool. And before it got returned to hand, um, tapping the Greenbelt Rampager to crew Heart of Kieran, then cast it a few more times until you get a point where it actually sticks in play. So suddenly Kowalski with a lot of mana to work, a lot of uh, power and toughness on the battlefield. And that potentially turns into mana when you start talking about Galta Primal Hunger. 
now. Disaster for Petr Zahurek here. Does not find his fourth land. He really does need to make sure that he hits land drops in the early turn. We can see that the, the sum total of mana cost in his hand substantial and approach the second turn at seven mana. He has very few ways of actually winning the game until he hits that sort of five, six, seven mana mark. Right now, it's just about treading water, hoping that he's going to be alive long enough to be able to find them. Yet another copy of Seal Away coming from uh, Petr Sahurek here. Uh, dealing with Greenbelt Rampager. But on three life, even the remaining creatures could potentially be enough to close things out. And this a vital force, also problematic. We had a fairly long game one. We had an incredibly ch quick game two. And we're going to get a chance to uh, move around things a little bit. Uh, looks like we've got... Uh, a couple of our matches still doing some shuffling, but I'm sure that we will have some magic to bring you from our back table. That this being the table of Greg Papura against Andrew Cunio, a good old fashioned control matchup. Uh, we've got blue black control in the hands of Andrew Cunio. We know that this is one of the original players playing draw go back when the term was first uh, coined. Up against uh, Greg Papura, he's on blue black mid range, so not quite so much in the way of counter magic, but a little bit more in the way of board control and indeed board presence, uh, threats that in this case have already taken Andrew Cunio down to just two life. A field of ruin there for Andrew Cunio. Gets to search up a basic and it looks like after Initially showing an island, he went for Pump Fake and did go for the uh, the Swamp instead. Lots of mana available to both of these players, but if Andrew Cunio is looking to win this game, he's going to have to first deal with that 4-4 uh, Champion of Wits now in play, and then he's got a lot of damage to deal. And we heard from Marshall that uh, in game one, Andrew already had this problem of falling behind on the board and not, not really being able to stabilize. Here it might be a single creature that uh, ultimately ends up being a problematic for for his control deck. Yep. Has to pass things back. I can imagine that it's likely there's going to be some sort of removal. Goes for the Fatal Push. Of course, that token with a converted mana cost of zero. I mean, Papuro in the kind of luxurious position here of having a lot of cards in hand, a lot of life to work with. He just needs to resolve one threat to be able to get things going here. And I believe that he's also got a champion of wits in the graveyard. So when we say resolve, getting a creature in play under counter magic might be pretty straightforward for him here. Does go for that champion of wits. Now, the one potential wrinkle in that one could have been a disallow, but uh, Andrew Cuneo says that's fine. How fine he really believes it is is anybody's guess. But the, regardless, the Champion of Wits does resolve. Uh, drawing four, discarding two here. Have I played the land this turn? I believe I have, but I'm not sure. Last turn, you had four on tap, and you spent four on... I spent four on the Contempt, so I have not played a land. They're just double checking whether or not Greg's played a land. This is, it's, it's typically when you draw lots of extra cards in a turn, suddenly your options explode, and keeping track of everything that's been going on thus far can get a little fiddly. Good to double check with your opponent before you just hastily play a land and maybe get yourself in a spot of bother at a professional level event. Each of these players with a great record thus far on four and one, so missteps are certainly something to be avoided, and would, you'd feel them a little bit more here than maybe in any other event that you play in. And if you could hear what they were saying, they actually remembered how many lands were tapped and untapped for Greg on uh, on his last turn. So uh, by that, they could deduce if that he in fact had not played a land yet. So Vraska's contempt here, not only dealing with that champion of wits, also doubling up Cunio's life total there to four. And these field of ruins still being activated for Cunio here. What is he looking to achieve with these field of ruins? It feels to me like the what's going on is relatively negligible that he's, he's getting one basic land out of his deck. Am I missing something, maybe? No, I think he's just, uh, he's just doing it because he can. He's filtering his deck a little bit, getting a land out there. We don't know uh, how his hand is made up, but on four life, he doesn't have infinite time here. He needs to find uh, one, of his, one of his key cards to take over the game. And I guess this is game two, so Cunio probably has a fair idea of whether or not there are any real speciality lands with special abilities that would represent a higher priority target for that Field of Ruin. Yep. As things stand, 
the deck thinning, I guess, more valuable to him than maybe knowing that at some point there's going to be a transformed Ascanta. Yeah, I, I don't think that he's uh, playing against Ascanta, or at least uh, he he can be very certain that Greg isn't holding one. And Andrew, I, I only got a glimpse of the card he drew, but it might have been a Vizier of Many Faces. <laughs> so one of the few creatures you cannot play on an empty board. As things stand, slow and steady, we saw it win game one, but lose game two for uh, Petr Sohirik. Uh, and Andrew Cunio right now, slow and steady, not winning his race at all. Looks like the, the guys on the front table are ready. And given that this one could take a little bit of time, I'm sure that Marshall will give us an update if it um, closes out anytime soon. But let's head back to our main table between uh, Gregor Kowalski and Petr Sohirik, see whether or not approach of the second sun can hit second time around. So, so Hurik leads off with just an island. Um, sees Lamor Elves from the other side of things, but that one's not going to get dealt with just yet. Uh, in, in fact, I would say that Lamor Elves is a bit of a problem for the, uh, the control decks in as much as they can potentially cast multiple spells in a single turn, they can potentially play a bigger spell a little earlier, and turn one is when the shields are very much down for the blue white Accroach deck. They can also play around Syncopate much better, and they can keep open mana. Uh, f to protect their creatures. But at the same time, you're not super unhappy with Land of Elves because you want to punish uh, your opponents for overextending anyway with Fumigate. Sounds like we have got a final update on uh, how things went between Andrew Cunha and Greg Papura. Uh, no massive uh, surprises given how quick it was, but maybe Marshall can give us the full details. The way that that one ended up playing out down the stretch was uh, Purpura went for the Scarab God. That got Essence scattered. Then he had Liliana to get back the Scarab God. And with two lands in hand, Andrew scooped him up. Fair enough. And as things stand, it's no white mana yet for Petr Zahurek. He's got a Field of Ruin in play, so he can fix that if he so chooses. But for now, he's just looking on as Kowalski casts Threat after threat. This is what the green deck does. Green Belt Rampager, Still Leaf Champion, and a Crushing Canopy in hand here for Gregor Kowalski. The, the Canopy, kind of an interesting one. You can deal with an enchantment, you can deal with a flyer. In this instance, it's very much about being able to destroy enchantments, the reason it's made the, uh, the deck after sideboarding. Syncopate is able to deal with that Green Break ramp Rampager. Sure. With Syncopate, is it one of those counter spells that you just kind of, if you get a decent target, you just go for it, or is it something that you can afford to hold back? Uh, depends on the matchup. If you are, for example, uh, playing a mirror match, and you know that you have to prevent a fairy from resolving, then you're holding all of your counters and you're just trying to uh, work on your mana development. If you're playing against aggro, you know that at some point these syncopates are going to be uh, payable by your opponent. Uh, what are you going to do? Force them to pay 16? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Kowalski uh, is aggressively playing into syncopate, but Soteric is at the same time uh, aggressively using syncopate. As things stand, the other thing that Kowalski is doing aggressively, heading into the red zone already, so Hurek down to 11 life here. The first nine, they were easy. Let's see how well the last 11 go as Steel Leaf champion comes down for Kowalski. And Sotrek is holding that plane, so maybe he was faking a little bit. Maybe he wanted Kowalski to think that he didn't have double white available to him with that field of ruins. Yeah, it's something that I've seen control players do uh, over the years. The hold back the last land for a turn or so if you have a mass removal spell to try and throw your opponent off the notion that it could be something that's coming, maybe for, uh, suggest to them to overcommit more than they should otherwise be doing. Here we've got a glimmer of genius end of turn from Sahurik, and like one of the things that's cool about a lot of the blue-white control decks right now is they've got lots of quality instants that means even if they're not countering things, they're still progressing their game quite uh, relevantly at the end of turn. And I have to say, I like Sotrek's position here. Uh, he even found a Settle the Wreckage, so with the planes up, he now has uh, all the different ways of his deck to deal with uh, multiple creatures. And if Kowalski doesn't present 
enough threats, then Teferi will come down and uh, Kowalski is in real trouble. So that Fumigate, in addition to clearing the board, gaining three life for Petter. And a Brontodon coming down for Kowalski. It's able to deal with uh, artifacts and enchantments, which is certainly relevant, but in the meantime, it's just a sizable body that means that there will consistently be pressure on that life turtle of Seherek, though essentially he bought a turn or so simply from the, the life gain of uh, Fumigate. And here comes Teferi, immediately drawing a card for Petter, who plays a land, he gets to untap a couple of lands at the end of turn. Teferi it just does it all, drawing cards, effectively costing three. Yeah, could have could have minus three, Teferi, but um, wants to wants to get the advantage going as quickly as possible. I mean, I guess that Teferi is not getting killed anytime soon, and with three mana up, he has the potential to answer a large proportion of what might come from the other side of the battlefield. I, I like this position quite a bit for Petter Sehurek. And you can see here, he looks, just from his body language, in a bit more of a position of strength than he has been in much of the rest of this match, even. Um, he's got a better idea of exactly what is coming from his opponent, and that's only helping the control player here. Resilient Kenra coming along, that gave the Bronston enough power to be able to deal with Teferi in a way that Counter Magic was never going to stop. But here comes a Field of Ruin to deal with Hash of Oasis, does not have to want to have to worry about that creature pump, and activates it to make sure that the desert goes away and he gets an additional land in return. Nice mix of spells there in uh, Petter Sahurek's hand. Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, that's kind of going to get him everywhere he needs to go. But in the meantime, Glimmer of Genius to draw some cards, Settle Wreckage to deal with multiple threats, and a Syncopate, just in case something comes along that really does need countering. The Syncopate, of course, particularly good against the likes of a Resilient Kenra in hand, because when you counter spells with Syncopate, they do get exiled, and it means you don't need to worry about any kind of eternalized nonsense. Sotrek did lose did lose his lose his Teferi with the with the aggressive line that he took. He has a backup Teferi in hand though. I think he's still very favored here. And uh Kowalski should expect Saddle the Wreckage to be the card that Sotrek is planning to use here. Now playing around the first Settle the Wreckage, that's kind of straightforward enough, and we see Kowalski doing exactly that here. He's only attacking with one of his two creatures. And that says to me that he's very aware of the four mana instant and does not want to lose his entire board to it. Um, the second Settle the Wreckage, for whatever reason, it always feels that much trickier to play around. You value the land that you get out of it less, and indeed, um, you kind of naturally assume that your opponent couldn't possibly have a second one. As things stand, though, with Glimmer of Genius, at some point it becomes reasonable to think that um, Petas just has everything that he could possibly need in hand because drawing enough cards, he effectively does. And I, I really like uh, how Sartrick is consistently playing Seal Away at the end of his own turn, not really risking anything when he doesn't have to. Yep, top level play there from Sahurek, who gets that to Ferry in play, untaps a couple of land, draws a card. Plenty of mana left open. Four mana seems like a very s significant amount here. He can settle the wreckage, he can glimmer of genius. He's got to invoke the divine to work with. This is a great position for Zahurek here. And how do, you, how do you play if you're in Kowalski's seat? You have uh, a Teferi on the opposing side, you have Zahurek on 10, which is low but not low enough so that you're really threatening lethal soon. And it's almost impossible to play around Settle the Wreckage now. So Hashab Oasis here means that one creature can be en made enough to kill Teferi. As things stand, though, it's everything coming directly at Petr Sahurek, and one Settle the Wreckage means that all those creatures going away, yes, there's the consolation prize of a couple of lands, but you know what? Coming second place in a beauty contest is not what Gregor Kowalski came here for. Kowalski just went for lethal here. He just tried to win the game. Uh, attack for 10. Do you have it? Yes, you have it. Okay. I'll probably, most likely, 98% uh, sure lose. But if, if Sacheric doesn't have it there, then Kowalski just steals the game. Yeah, there's an interesting kind of line of reasoning that I'm a big fan of, of if you have this card, I can't win, so I'm going to assume you don't have this card and play accordingly. Give yourself the best chance of winning the game. And I think that 
given the amount of card drawing that uh, Sahuric has been able to work his way through, you kind of have to assume that you're not winning a game that's going to go long. So it's about taking your spots to try and win a game that goes short. Even if it doesn't work out, does not necessarily mean it was a, a bad line of play at all from Greg. And and ironic, ironically, in game one, had he aggressively used the blossoming defense, he probably would have won the game, but it would have been really reckless uh, to, to just assume that Soteric is on nothing. Yeah, treat, treating your um, blossoming defense as a burn spell is almost always not what it's all about. And what Soteric has been doing very well in this game is making sure that if it's being used to counter removal, that's all it's achieving, and it's not also generating extra points of damage. Teferi Hero of Dominaria there, doing it all, uh, slowly but surely ticking up on loyalty, and if you do ever get that ultimate, well, the emblem is very potent indeed, but if all you're doing is drawing extra cards, untapping lands, maybe putting problematic permanents on to, uh, close to the top of your opponent's library, that already plenty uh, from the Planeswalker. So along comes the next in the cavalcade of threats from Kowalski, but Look at the amount of land in play for uh, Petr Zahurik. Look at the amount of loyalty on that Teferi. All of these things really make life very, very problematic for uh, the Kowalski fans out there. Team Card Hoarder, uh, sorry, Team Snapcaster is uh, Greg Kowalski's team. On the other side of things, revelation for uh, Petr Zahurik. Now, what needs to happen for uh, Kowalski to get out of this spot that he finds himself in here? Is it literally that your opponent is holding nothing but lands, or is there a more realistic line that uh, Kowalski could work through? I was I was going to mention this uh, uh, for exactly that reason. He needs to draw threat after threat after threat and hope that Soteric doesn't have the right answers to them. However, he is fighting an uphill battle here. Teferi is just drawing extra cards, and at some point... Search for a scan tab will come down, and this ability of untapping two lands is also just super powerful. Yeah, untapping your Ascan to the Sunken Ruin, particularly demoralizing for opponents, as you just get all of that card advantage writ large. Uh, we saw a nice little play there from Kowalski as he was attacking in and a Settler Wreckage came along. That Thrashing Brontodon took out a Seal Away to produce an untapped Lamoir Elves. If you're going to let the Dino die, that Lamoir Elves is slightly more valuable than a land coming into play. Yeah, I, I like I like this little plan of trying to go for the ench enchantments because it gives you effectively instant speed creatures with Crashing Canopy and the, the Brontodon. But Soteric never really put anything super scary under um, under the seal away. Each and every turn a creature comes along, Peta just says, yep, sure. <laughs> and unfortunately for Kowalski, Sure means surely not good enough. Kowalski even putting uh, Life Crafter's Best Cherry in the graveyard. Definitely a card you bring in against control. We might even see the ultimate here of Teferi, finally. So now whenever Sahurek draws a card, he gets to exile target permanent and opponent controls. Teferi looking very stern there, slightly looking down on his opponent almost. And cycling a card has never felt better than when you get to exile one of your opponent's permanents. And that's saying something, because cycling always feels great, unless it's literally on a bicycle, in which case it can be pretty painful, especially up hills. And that's enough for the, the, the scoop there from Kowalski. Uh, Planeswalker ultimates, we call them ultimate for a reason. Uh, that was enough for uh, Petr Sehurek to be able to win out in his uh, game three there. He advances to five and one, uh, blue, white, doing uh, good work there for him in the feature match area. And actually, when it comes to blue-white, we're going to get a chance to find out a little bit more of it, because by the sounds of things, we have a deck tech uh, imminently from a previous Pro Tour champion, Luis Salvato. He's going to tell us all the details on blue-white. Do not go anywhere. More magic after these messages. Grab a friend and head into battle with Magic's upcoming release, Battle Bond. Play Sealed or Booster Draft as you pair up in this two-headed giant casual format. Available at your local game store starting June 8th. Find your store at locator.wizards.com.
Hi there, welcome back to the news desk. Murray Berthold, Rich Hagen, and by our count, so far in the tournament, there are six players who are currently undefeated at 6-0. and Of course, one of them, John Finkel, considered by many to be the greatest player of all time, undefeated right, right now. Right, that, that's easily the headline act, right, in, in any 6-0 and list. Uh, we've also got, though, Pro Tour champion Lucas Esperberto uh, of Brazil. Uh, so he's a uh, perfect record so far. Greg Orange, a.k.a. the Citrus Assassin, wearing his shirt that says Citrus on the back of it here today at 6-0. I didn't realize he was actually Citrus on the shirt. That's, oh, yes. that's very good. Thomas Hendricks of the Netherlands, uh, longtime uh, platinum and gold pro uh, from the Netherlands, 6-0 and as well. All right, Atsuki Kihara from Japan is at 6-0. and Right, the PTQ winner from Grand Prix Seattle a couple of months ago. Um, let's see who else. Um, Ernest Lim from Singapore. Now, uh, he's played like half a dozen PTs, uh, but only a 40% win rate. So I think that's going to bump up quite a little bit. 6-0, comfortably in today too. Great job by him. Um, I'm sure we've missed someone. Yes, Andrea Mangucci right, yeah. at 6-0. and And guess what? We're going to hear from him right now. He's with BDM. Thanks, Maria. I'm here with 6-0 and o Pro Tour Dominaria competitor, Andrea Mangucci, of course, a World Magic Cup champion. Uh, Andrea, yes. how, how was your preparation for this tournament, and uh, how do you feel it's borne out over these first rounds? Yeah, it was uh, we, me and team MTG Mint, Garden Connected Company, playtested together as always for uh, more than a week in a house in uh, Washington. And uh, yeah, we played a lot of Magic. I don't think I've ever gone out uh, of my house. We only played Magic the whole time, and it's great. And uh, today I'm 6-0, so the work is uh, paying so far. Now, half of that 6-0 comes in the draft rounds where you went undefeated. You went 3-0 in draft, and because Elias Watzfeld, the leader in the race to win the Draft Master invite to the World Championship, went 2-1, and one, that means you closed within two matches of him for that uh, coveted slot at the World Championship. Yeah. Uh, how are you feeling? Uh, were, you, were you thinking that that was something within reach for you coming into this tournament? Actually, no. I didn't even know my place in the <laughs> in the draft master. When you said that to me, I was like, really? Because yeah, I did go six so last time, but I usually go pretty bad in draft. Like the two purchases ago, I was three three. Usually, I'm very good in uh, in constructing. Like I go seven three or eight two in the last like um, five or six pro tours, and I always go like four two. You know, that that range. But this time is going well. Uh, my team is obviously out to me incredibly, so yeah, big shout out to them. Now, your team is, is known for coming up with some crazy limited decks. Obviously, the very controversial Slither Blade strategy well, it was something that came out of your testing group. Yes. Uh, is that something you guys have found for this draft format? Uh, I didn't find anything in particular. Everything was pretty open, so it was whether like you can read well your seat or not, what you get passed, what you pass, and etc. Someone in my team likes uh, white a lot, white, black, and white, blue particular. So I was white, I saw the Arvad, the white, black legend, I just took it, and then I just ride the white, black train, and uh, yeah, it went, it went pretty well. So some some really like kind of like almost classic draft philosophy comes into play here. Just you know find yeah, the right probably. cards in the right seat. Uh, now you got to go probably have to go 3-0 tomorrow, and then you'll also need some help from Elias. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, off to a great start here overall for your individual performance at this Pro yes. Tour. Uh, tell me about uh, what you brought to the standard table. I play red black vehicles which is a very basic deck, but that's basically all I'm playing. In the last, again, five or six Pro Tours, I never brought anything new, like humans, team energy, or zombies, you know, everything basic. At the Pro Tour, nowadays, you don't really need to be, like, fancy, play the best deck, sorry, play, like, the fancy deck. You can just play the best deck, tune it well, know your sideboarding, play well, and uh, you can do very well at the Pro Tour without the team backup. Now, a bunch of good players also at 6-0. Anyone in particular you're looking forward to facing as we go down the stretch here at Pro Tour Dominaria? Yeah, you told me John Fink at 6-0. I really like to play against him because uh, I have a good record against him. So, yeah, I'll be happy to play against him next round. There are not that many players in the room who are going to say that, that I, I'm really looking forward to playing against John Finkel. Andrea Mangucci, 6-0, and looking to play the GOAT. Thanks so much, BDM. Well, you can see the players milling around there waiting for round seven to start. But right now, we've got our last Pro Tour champion. He won it all with Lantern Control. But what on earth is he playing in standard? Luis Salvato is with Paul Chian for a deck tech.